Hey Abracadabra fans, it's Margaret coming to you live from the shop and we're going to be joined with Natalie Lepruzzi shortly. So a lot of you probably know Natalie already. She's our apprentice jeweler here at Abra and she's been with us um, since the winter of 2018. <laughs> but she's also a jeweler in her own right and she has her own line of jewelry that we share, that we, um, excuse me, that we carry here in the shop. Um, I'm actually wearing some of her earrings right now. Some beautiful sterling silver earrings with chrysocolla center stone. I like them a lot. They have a great weight to them. And I love this color too. So Nat is going to join us shortly and she's going to show us her workspace and some of the things that she's been working on. And then we're going to talk about her work and how she got into jewelry making. She should be joining us shortly. I hope everyone's um, enjoying the sunshine today. Bright blue skies here in downtown Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. All right, Nat just asked to join, so we're going to go live into her room. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> a little bit of a different frame. Yeah. <laughs> Fancy seeing you here. <laughs> I haven't seen your <laughs> face in a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, because we always have our masks on when we're here in the shop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so what are you working on today, Natalie? Well, um, one of the things that I like to create when I'm not necessarily making jewelry, um, it's something that's kind of relaxing to me, is I um, will cut out leaves and make buttons with them. Um, I've done many different, I have made a pendant in the past. Um, I feel as though the um, cutting metal with a jeweler saw is just one of the, you know, basic functions of being a metalsmith or a jeweler and it's um, something I love. It's just super um, meditative for me and um, something I'm doing constantly um, pretty much every day. And so um, I already kind of, I printed out um, a Michigan oak leaf and I think it's an oak leaf. Let's reframe that. Yeah, it's an oak leaf. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, and I started cutting it out because it does take quite some time to um, cut these things out. Um, so I, I figured I would show you a little bit of cutting this with the jeweler saw at my bench. Oh. And so this right here is a, a bench pin. Um, it's really common for jewelers to use this. Um, one thing I love when I go see another jeweler's studio um, is what their bench pin is designed like because they can always be like so unique. People cut different shapes into them to help them while they're working. Mine's not super uh, crazy, but it is uh, formed in a way that I enjoy. Um, and uh, the bench pins used to, you know, stabilize the metal as well as kind of be a safety for you so that when you're cutting, you would end up cutting into the wood versus your hand, because um, it is a dangerous tool. And so I'm gonna go ahead and Start cutting here. So you actually have that um, like taped onto your metal. Is that right? I actually um, I use rubber cement oh, um, okay. to put it on there. So that's yeah, very common way to go ahead and do it. I know that some people use double sided tape. Um, there's so many different ways to go about it for sure. <laughs> Can you see this all right? I can see that, and I can hear too. <laughs> yeah. Whenever I see you guys sawing at the meadow, it looks like you're working really hard. Is it really physically hard to do that? Um, I I think so. Yeah, especially after doing it for a while, it can definitely be um pretty strong on your arms in a lot of ways. Um, it depends what you're cutting. If you're cutting something that's really thick, it can definitely be um relatively difficult to cut through. So. Um, this is like the first tool that really is ever shown if you're in a class. So. Very fundamental tool. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that people try to do is these, these uh, blades break all the time. So it's always kind of a 
um, like a challenge to try not to break a blade. I'm sure I'm going to today, so <laughs> that might happen, but um, it's definitely something to strive for. Kind of like a mindfulness task for you almost? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's um, very meditative. Um, it's, I enjoy doing it a lot. Um, so there's only, it's a, I'm always just trying to progress the skills. Like I can see myself getting faster um, at doing it um, as you go. So it's, this right here is such a, a big leaf when, you know, when I'm at Abra or when I do jewelry stuff, it's a lot smaller. So it can, I enjoy kind of going back and forth with the different techniques to um, just kind of change things up a bit and um, like change my mindset, I suppose, in a way, like how I think about stuff. So. Okay. Imagine when you start the leaf, you had a much, um a much simpler leaf, <laughs> not an oak with all the, with all the, oh, the different to it, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, I mean, yeah, the, I think the very first thing I ever cut out was a um, bird that was like a bird half tree, um, and it was pretty wild, but um, yeah, it, it definitely gets more difficult as you get uh, into more detail. Yeah. But, um, constantly spinning it around. It just makes me feel like you're so up and close and personal with the material. Um, there's different machines out there, like a water jet or something that you can use modern technology to cut things out. But I, I really enjoy just being like right up in with the material and just like really having my hands um, in there. It's definitely something that's important to my practice. But yeah, I don't know how much today we're going to cut out, but you can kind of see where it's starting to take form. Um, it might take me, honestly, another half hour, 20 minutes to cut this all the way out, which might be a little bit too long for today. But I feel like that's a kind of a good example of a tool that I'm using constantly. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looks like a great start to a beautiful piece. What do you think you'll do with that? I think I'll probably end up making it another, um, like a brooch. Um, I, f I find myself cutting these leaves often too around this time. It's like season change is coming. Um, I think that they make really nice look like on a, a winter coat um, mm -hmm. or something along those lines. So I'm also like just super interested in nature. And I feel like getting hands on with an element like this helps me to, you know, remember what an oak leaf looks like and just like thinking more about what everything is outside instead of just a leaf like trying to put a name to it I suppose in a way but like educational <laughs> but yeah yeah I, I know that you have a beautiful leaf brooch that you wear on your winter coat that I've always admired oh thank you yeah yeah I really enjoy that one I can't wait to wear it again I'm excited yeah. for the season change almost time almost time mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> So what else have you been working on lately? So um, I'm going to go ahead and take you off of here. And we're going to step on over. So um, I have recently acquired um, some used casting equipment that I'm super excited to get set up. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have that set up located here. But what I do have is my um, wax bench where I'm starting to get all the different components ready for the metal casting process. Um, I do a casting process called Lost Wax. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very um, popular way to go about doing that. And so there's all different ways you can go about doing that, whether it's just carving the wax by hand or making molds out of objects. So here I have a bone and then I have the molds of that bone. This I actually made at Wayne State. This is a vulcanized um, mold. I've also made a variety of silicone molds. Um, and so you make the mold and then you fill that up with wax and then you get something like this in wax and there's all different colors 
And then with this, I then go ahead and make an investment mold, put it in the kiln, the wax melts out, and then I replace that with metal, often bronze. Um, and so that's how a lot of my different castings are done. Um, I'm really into natural casting as well, which is similar to lost wax, but you actually put the real natural object in its place and that burns out mm -hmm. and is then replaced with metal. Um, and so I've always just been really interested in mold making and the challenge behind it. Um, that's definitely one of the things that has attracted me to bones because it can be really difficult to get all these like little details and caverns and to be able to make a, a mold where um, something like this can come out. Here's an example. Um, of like a sprue tree I did in college. It's really funny to look at this one now, um, now that I've had um, quite some experience at Abra with casting, because this button is huge. But <laughs> anyways, not, nowadays when I work with gold, I, I don't do things like that. But, um, and so I have, yeah, a variety of different tools um, to work with wax. I can heat up the wax and use different like dental tools to carve into it or files um i'm always trying i, I really want to start expanding my ability to carve rings so that's another thing that i would like to focus on um and so yeah that's one of the things and can then see, so sorry to interrupt Nick. can we see some of those natural objects again i couldn't quite tell what some of them were yeah so here, I, this is a, you know, a walnut. And then these are all things that I, I find in the woods. So I'm not necessarily sure what they are. I'll just like, I go on a lot of nature walks and yeah. I'll see things that look interesting to me and I'll, I'll pick them up. I found this the other day. I feel like I'm often looking for stuff that would be like impossible to make a mold of. Like when I look at this object in particular, I'm like, how would you make a mold of that? And it, yeah. it just intrigues me um, in a lot of ways. Um, here's an example of a natural cast where I actually had a real scorpion. It wasn't alive. It was a, a scorpion that had passed. And um, I cast him out. And so you really can get a lot of detail um, when you're doing something like that, um, which is pretty cool. But natural casting, it's also, it's a little risky. It's not um, as precise as wax. So even on this scorpion, I lost a lot of feet there. So, but I kind of like the happy accident. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And then over here, um, I've assembled this table to kind of show a lot of different things that I've done in the past and I'm working on now. Um, within my own studio practice, I always have a table set up with a lot of just different things laid out. Um, do you ever make molds of your favorite casts? Hmm. I don't think I've done that yet, but it's definitely something that I would like to do in the future. Um, now that I have that new equipment, I'm hoping to really um, start getting back into mold making and stuff like that. Um, I haven't done a whole lot of it since um, leaving school. Mm -hmm. But um yeah, this table has a variety of things on here. I'm not sure where we should start. I have some of my earliest pieces over here and some how of my... About, how about we start with some of the, the pieces that you're working on now that are going to be for sale soon? Okay, sounds great. So, currently I'm working on... Um, we are um, making some more of this earring design that mm -hmm. I've done in the past so mm -hmm. that I can have another pair um, for sale at Abra. Um, I'm working on this different earring design here. Um, I'll make the different components and then kind of lay them out and I'll switch it up s s hundreds of times sometimes before I finally yeah. decide what I want to do. Um, so I have different pendants that I'm working on. Um, I like making step bezels, which is a bezel where you're able to see the back of the stone. Oh, okay. um, this is like a dendric, dendri I think it's dendric agate. I might be pronouncing that incorrectly, but I plan on turning into a pendant. Um, I'm working on some more earring designs. Um, a few months ago, I made this pair of earrings 
And it really just kind of inspired me to, um, I've been making a lot of different designs that are kind of based off of this, mm -hmm. like the these earrings I have here and the ones that I currently have for sale at Abra that are somewhat similar to this, but different. Um, I'm really attracted to circles and um, to geometry in that way. Um, when I look at these, I often think of horizons um, and things of that nature, which mm -hmm. is always something that I'm in, um, intrigued by. I love a good horizon, good sunset. Yeah, um, I, I like that design. It's like a, a variation of the door knocker earring style. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, that's definitely definitely something that is similar for sure. Mm -hmm. um, lately, I've been also trying to um, make some more rings. Um, mm -hmm. I, other than when I'm at Abra, you know, I'm working on rings all the time, but I haven't been doing it as much in my own personal studio um, in a while. So I'm trying to incorporate that in. And so I've been thinking about different ways that I want to connect um these oddly shaped cabochons to the band mm -hmm. and just kind of exploring that element and i'm hoping that that will be something that will be seen a lot more here's like another um ring in progress with the band that i'll end up soldering to the bottom of this stone and so that's definitely something that i want to move towards um and yeah, and then I still have a bunch of different castings that I would like to use in different pieces um, floating around. Um, I recently um, acquired some really nice turquoise from a local vendor, um, Tree Town Treasures, that I'm really excited to start working with him some more. He recently started making cabs, so I, I'm excited to start making some jewelry with that. And some of your stones from uh, Tree Town Treasures. Um, mm -hmm. Where are some other places that you that you get your stones from, or how do you go about selecting stones for a piece? Um, well, another um, local place that I'll go to is World of Rocks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I've that. been. <laughs> yeah, they're really they're really awesome there. Um, I also um, I've gone to a lot of different kind of gem shows in the past. Mm -hmm. um, I. Um, where else have I gone? Yeah, pretty much just like there's a variety of different gem shows that you can go to. Um, nowadays, it's kind of different. Um, right. There's different like people from Instagram that I'll purchase with that I've either met at a gem show and still stay in contact with. As of lately, I've mainly been purchasing from World of Rocks and Tree Town Treasures, but I'm always kind of switching it up. I do have an interest um, myself in some day creating my own cabochons um mm -hmm. that would be something in the future um i've been doing a lot of rock finding in nature yeah. for example this is like um some fossil coral i found mm -hmm. in michigan that i would yeah, like to cool. go ahead and turn into a cab someday if you can see like looking at mm -hmm. this compared to this it's relatively similar but this is a, a finished product and this is more in process so yeah do you have a favorite stone to work with um I do really enjoy working with the coral um mm -hmm. it's I just love all the like the contrast in it and all the different cavities and I feel I've become attached to it too because I've found it um more than mm -hmm. any other stone like actually in nature so there's just like a connection there um I love chrysocolla as well, which is this stone right here. Um, this stone is has a relation to copper, which I think is really awesome because I love copper um, and I just love the blue colors. Um, just reminds me of nature or going to the water or um, something like that. So I'm always attracted to those kinds of colors and kind of similar to Dendrick Agate. This reminds me of being in a wintry wooden uh, world and so those are the kind of images I like to see so yeah I have cola in my earrings today right yes you do yep yeah they, they look great on you thank you <laughs> yeah they have that beautiful um turquoise color mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> but slightly different mm -hmm. cool all right 
Um, do you have any more of your workspace to show us? Sure. Alrighty. So you guys saw me kind of working on my bench earlier today, but this is kind of a side view of my jeweler's bench. It's kind of a traditional jeweler's bench. One thing that sets this apart from other benches, I'd say right from the get go is the catch drawer. Um, I'm constantly working with little objects that fall. And so that's really helpful for that. And it's also really helpful because it catches all my metal dust. And so then I can go ahead and recycle the silver and the different things that I use um, later on, which is just great for the environment as well. Um, there's so many little tools that can go into metal smithing. Lots of little bips and bops we have over here, pliers, and this is like a typical kind of stone setting tool. It's a burnisher. Um, and then I also do kind of small scale soldering here. Um, I have bigger torches that I use at Abra and then also um, where I have my casting equipment. But at home, I use this little butane torch. Love this guy. Mm -hmm. And I can do some soldering over my little soldering station. Got a little ventilation. And yeah, that's basically it. Over here, I do have like a bunch of metal smithing books. Uh, Margaret, thank you, uh, gave me this bookshelf. So that was really yeah. awesome. I'm excited. I'm always trying to expand my knowledge and I love referencing these different books. Um, and yeah, that's the, the studio so far, pretty much. Um, got lots of different hammers and, and whatnot. Um, but yeah. yeah. You have a nice setup there. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we can chat a little bit about your background, and then as we do that, we can look at some of the pieces throughout your throughout your um, development as an artist. Sounds good. Yeah. So um, you came to Abra in the winter of 2018, and I know before that you had a pretty interesting job. You worked on conserving sculptures in the Detroit area. Yeah. Uh, what sculptures did you work on? Did you work on any that the audience might be familiar with? Um, well, yeah, when I was at that job, we did a lot of sculpture conservation and maintenance and some of the bigger places that are well known is we did many, if, if not almost all of the sculptures at Cranbrook School. Um, we maintained those as well as the Detroit Zoo, um, as well as the Marshall Fredericks Museum, um, all the bronze sculptures there. And um, I, I worked a lot in Marshall Fredericks, who is the artist that made um, the Spirit of Detroit um, downtown, or the mm -hmm. Spirit of Hope in Detroit downtown. Um, so that's definitely a, a pretty popular one. Um, I, before working that job, I didn't realize how much work he really had. It's, it's all over the place, all over Michigan. Um, he was definitely inspired by Carl Mills, which is another artist that I maintain a lot. Um, he was an instructor at Cranbrook, so they have a lot of his sculptures there. Um, we mainly worked on bronze sculptures, um, and um, bronze needs maintenance after a while, and so um, we would, you know, go and clean them, and we would use, like, this very special archival soap and okay. clean them off, and then um, we would then, you know, look at the patina, see if we needed to change the patina, which would be like the coloring of the metal. Um, mm -hmm. And that was just a case by case kind of thing. But generally we would, um, after cleaning them, then wax the sculptures, which the wax gives it a nice coating to help protect it from um, all the crazy weather and stuff outside. Um, and then- Kind of like washing a car? Yes. Where you have to rub it on and then let it dry and rub it on. Yes, and I almost every day I was thinking in my head, wax on, wax off, wax on, wax off. Like it was definitely it was it was very labor intensive, but I just I really appreciated it. I think it's important to conserve these things. Like as a maker, I I would hope that if I ever had a piece that was out in public that you know someone would want to take care of it, and so like mm -hmm. it. Makes I want to be able to take care of other people's work. Um, you know, I know how, how much labor goes into something like that to create a bronze sculpture is just so intense. Um, we did some of that as well when I was working at that um, conservation job and 
So I definitely got to get a lot of experience in that through that job as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> oh, did you learn anything about sculptures doing that? Um, yeah, like one of the things that kind of blew my mind and I never really considered before um, is that, you know, modern day welding is kind of a, a new technique, as you can say. I mean, it's over a hundred years old now, I believe, but back in the day, like when they would make a sculpture, all the different parts of like a body would be cast separate, like the arm would be cast separate from the chest generally. And so they would actually have to rivet those together. Um, riveting is just like a way to do a cold connection. But I was always so impressed how well they were able to hide their rivets. Um, I just assumed that it was all welded. Um, another thing I learned was um, that there would be little holes inside of sculptures that are often hidden in places that were likely to collect water. And so that was a way to kind of get the water out of those areas, um, which was just always like, I, I mean, I getting so up and close and personal and really touching the sculptures as I was, I got to really kind of get to know a lot more about them, I guess. <laughs> so if we like visualize the thinker at the DIA, mm -hmm. so like his arm is riveted to his torso, I assume so. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's always done, you know, quite differently in a lot of different ways. Um, but if, yeah, it makes me want to go up and touch it. Nowadays, you know, I don't <laughs> tell it me if I just go up and start touching it. But um, yeah, I, I, would, I am curious about that. I'm, I'm exactly they did it, but that's probably very likely. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing that you saw at this job, yeah. where all parts of like a human figure would be all the limbs are welded on, riveted on, rather, mm -hmm. riveted on. and then yep. there's holes hiding in little places for drainage. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's really interesting. It's something that you don't really think of, even as someone who's enjoying a piece of public art like that, like you're standing far enough away that you might not see all those little details of how it really works. Nice. Yeah. I think it's yeah the, the hidden magic behind the scenes kind of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Like that, the hidden magic of the sculptures. <laughs> yep. So how did you get into jewelry making then? Um, well, I went to um, high school in Ann Arbor. I, I moved from Dearborn to Ann Arbor High School. And at Pioneer High School, we had a metalsmith jewelry class um, with Help Miss Help Bunch. And that class changed my life. I mean, that's where it all got started. I took um, many semesters there. Um, it was, it just, without that class, I probably wouldn't be here today, to be honest. Like, I knew nothing about this world before then, and um, had such a great teacher. Um, and that's definitely where it kind of all got started. And you said it was Helen Bunch, right? Mm hmm Yes. Helen shout Bunch. out to her. Hopefully she's in yeah. the audience. This mm -hmm. is the later. <laughs> yeah. So, what were some of the projects that you did in Helen's class? Um, well, I remember initially, like, the, I'm pretty sure the first project we did was that cutout I was mentioning earlier. I unfortunately don't have my very first project still. I was wearing mm -hmm. it, lost it. But I do have a different project, which is located right here. This is this <laughs> skull barrette that I made in high school, and it's... um. Look at that early soldering work. Gotta love it. It's <laughs> like, um, so I inlaid epoxy and mother of pearl and also chalk. And so it's kind of just like, I guess you could call it like the broke man's enamel or something like that. But yeah. it was a great project for me to learn about like creating all these different cells with the wire and mm -hmm. whatnot. So this, I'd say this project really transformed me into um, wanting to be, to do more. It It became just like an obsession, I suppose. Um, did you actually wear that? <laughs> I did. I did. Yeah, yeah. I would wear it in, in my hair. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't think I could do this one handed right now, but it does yeah. open up and kind of, let's see here. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's kind of what it looks like. <laughs> <Can't get better laughs> <than that. laughs> but yeah. 
And then um, after taking um, that class at Pioneer, I um, soon knew that I wanted to get a degree in metalsmithing. I believe Helen was also the one that just made me aware that that was even a thing. I never mm. would have imagined that it existed. And um, so I actually, I went to WCC for a couple of years and got a lot of my generals done. I had a great, I had a really great experience at WCC. Um, and then I moved to Wayne State. I mean, moved to Detroit and started going to Wayne State. This is one of my very first uh, projects at Wayne State. It was a riveting project. Here's some examples of some visible rivets right there. Um, and so this is that, definitely... Uh, what is that? Is that a belt buckle? It's a belt buckle, yes. Yep. And uh, looking at this is always kind of funny to me because I can just see all of my like early things that I would have never thought of before. Like, for example, when I drilled this hole here, I can see where the drill skidded away, uh, which is something nowadays I'd be like, oh, no, clean that off. But <laughs> I think it's cute that I, I didn't notice. Um, here's some other early Wayne State pieces. Um, it's one of my few Wayne State pieces where I actually set a stone. This was also like my first etching project. Um, many of the projects that we would um, be given at Wayne State would be technique based as well as conceptually based um so for example this one we were supposed to make a tea infuser um which is a great way to learn how to make a hinge and to make a clasp um but then also i went conceptually with it as well um this is based off of um a woman who was apparently the longest living at the time and she was a there. She was being interviewed, and she was a heavy smoker. Which I was like, "Wow, how has she lived so long?" And she smokes, but I guess she said she drank boiling hot tea every day. So that's inspired. So that she lungs are those are those methods. Yes, yeah, yes, okay. definitely. Yeah, and with the etching and stuff there. Very mm -hmm. cool. Thank you. Um, this is like a early kind of collaboration. My I cast these fish, and my friend blew the glass around it and so that was kind of a fun one working with someone else to see like what we could get away with um <laughs> here's some of my early rings this is one of my very first rings highly patinaed i've always been interested in coloring the metal um using color as almost like paint um this was a a fun one too we had a class assignment where we had to make a piece of jewelry one piece of jewelry a week and this one was frustrating because I, I dropped the stone and it broke in half but then i i just said it anyways so i always mm -hmm. liked having that guy around some other kind of earlier ring designs there you goes the belt buckle good thing it's metal <laughs> what is that next to the, the lung tea infuser this is um, a heart um, and it's essentially kind of a sculpture. Um, this was the first time I ever used a hydraulic press, which is a machine that I also use to create this as well as some of the other pieces I'll show you. I have some dies from that as well that I can show you in a moment. Um, and it was just a, quite a learning experience to draw something and then to really try to create it three dimensionally. Um, I had yeah. a lot of fun the sky um enjoy the movement and so those two definitely kind of were within the same year i had i was thinking a lot about medical things so yeah this is also one of my really early projects it was one of my first projects and it'd be hard to kind of show but it's like an optical illusion box and you can look inside of here and there's like a kaleidoscope kind of effect Mm -hmm. So that's definitely some like art school style <laughs> stuff going on there. Um, pieces that I have in progress from school um, up here. Unfortunately, my lights just went out on these, but these were also pieces that I created at Wayne State using the hydraulic press. Um, I have a deer as well as a bat. And these, all of these pieces, for the most part, I have photos of, and they're on my website, which is natalielabruzzi.com. Mm -hmm. Here's an example of a mold that I would use in the hydraulic press. 
to then create that form, you put a sheet of copper on there and you put pressure on it to, to where it fills that form. And then that's how you get these kinds of different shapes. But there's also different forms like with this, it's represe, which I actually have sitting right over here. We use uh, something like this, which is a pitch bowl and a chasing hammer. And then you have all these different tools to push your metal to create different designs. Um, so if you're pushing your metal into that bowl, that, which mm -hmm. has the wood in it? Yeah, this is like a, it's like a tree-based kind of sap material and you heat it up and then you put your metal inside of there and then it kind of holds it in, but it holds it in in just the right way that it has some give to it. So then you can go using a hammer and use all these different types of tools to create different forms within your metal. So that's so that. how, are the, how are those classes at Wayne State, how did they compare to working on the bench here at Abra? Um, well, I feel like at Wayne State, it was like, you know, definitely it was like a, less about like function and more about like concept. Though we would talk about function as well, um, it was it was definitely more um, metal based. Where we would do all different sorts of techniques. Like I learned blacksmithing, which is generally where you work with iron, um, and I using the hydraulic press and created vessels and things like this nature. So it's like the term metalsmith generally. Um, it's it's like a jack of all trades like you you do all different forms whereas like at abra it's very specific like fine jewelry like being mm -hmm. a goldsmith and also working with stones which um when i was in school like stones wasn't something that we would really work with it was super mm -hmm. metals based um and so that was kind of a, a difference there was to really start including incorporating stones a lot more into my work um and also like now I think a lot more about the functionality. Like I want something to last forever that I make. I don't, yeah. I want it to be um, timeless in a lot of ways. Um, and so I feel like at Wayne State though, like there's so many, like without having, it's nice to have, like when you're in art school, without having the pressure of like a customer or whatnot, you can just kind of work freely. And if it doesn't work, that's fine. And like, just, you know, to, to see what you can explore through your happy accidents and and whatnot. So I always, I try to make sure that I, I do both. Like I have the serious aspect and then I also kind of have the like freeing um, experimental aspect as well. So. so here you're trying to marry that idea of beautiful and functional and durable. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Yep. Yep. I want to go as, big as I can like I love statement but I also want it to be fun to wear and I want it to last a long time so yeah <laughs> did you um as you were talking about like concept versus functionality I wonder if you ever actually tried to use your your lung tea strainer um that I wouldn't use just because okay. it's uh covered in liver sulfur and so oh. <laughs> okay so that's but that's not functionality. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, I think that is a good example of a piece that's kind of talking about function, um, but it's not functional. It's like more as um, a way to tell a story, like something to use as like a, a narrative stepping point um, and whatnot. So that's definitely things that I'm really interested in, um, in a lot of ways to be able to tell my story or other people's stories. Um, so yeah and learn like when i made the deer and the bat i did so much research on horseshoe bats like i was just really like i learned a lot through that which wasn't necessary i think to make it mm -hmm. but in my eyes it was and so i like how making can open up all these different avenues of learning for me um essentially a craft school they you can either um, they have one week to two week classes where you go to the school, you um, sleep there, you eat there. Um, when I went, there's all different ways to come. 
yeah it's like it's like camp for sure um it's definitely super just like you're super immersed in what you're doing there and you get to meet so many different other makers um while you're there which is really cool and you also like a craft school for the most part would generally have like a metal department metal and jewelry a blacksmithing a wood department glass painting um photography um ceramics uh fibers so all the just kind of different and i apologize if i'm missing any of them but all the different forms of craft and so it's cool to be able to communicate with those people too because i feel like we're all very similar like even ceramics and metal smithing we have a lot of similarities or glass and metal smithing um especially when you start talking about enamel um and so when I when I went down to Penland, I did a work study. So I worked for them um, in the kitchens, which was cool to just like be able to see kind of the behind the scenes. Um, and I also took a workshop with Erica Bello, where I learned how um, she it was on vessel making. And so mm -hmm. I could show kind of some of the different things I did. Like, well, when I went to Aramont, I took an enamel class. That was the most recent one. That was a week long. I also stayed there and that was really cool. And just, it's like super immersive. Um, it was really mm -hmm. awesome to learn about enamel because I had never done it before. When I was at- that from Aramont? Where is Aramont? Like Aramont's located in um, Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Okay. Um, and it's kind of wild there because you're, you are kind of right in downtown Gatlinburg, but also it's surrounded by nature. So even there we had to like, we, we couldn't leave food in our cars in case of bears. Like you had to, you just felt like you were like kind of ruggeding it, but it was, it was just such a great learning experience to be able to see like what all of these different people are making. Um, and so. There you learned enamel work or you worked on enamel work. I, yeah, that's where I learned how to do um, enamel work. Um, and so this is like copper inside of here. And then there's um, many, many, many layers of glass mm -hmm. that um, is, you know, essentially cooked onto here in a kiln. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like a very traditional way. These days when you when someone says enamel, it's sometimes you're, it's hard to know exactly what they're talking about because there's so mm -hmm. many different products that will be called enamel. But glass enamel is definitely the traditional kind and it's just a great way to get color in a piece besides um patina so it's I'm, I'm always wanting to understand how things are made um I think it's helpful too especially since like I'll have to do a lot of repairs to just be able to understand how something is done in case I have to fix it someday um or to understand how to fix it so um and then here's what I made at Penland, which are... Where's Penland? Penland's located in North Carolina. It's about okay. an hour north of Asheville. It's a beautiful place. If anybody ever gets the opportunity to go out there, I'd highly suggest it. Um, just a great way to kind of shut out, you know, I guess reality and just really just focus in and um, make like, we would be doing like, 14 hour days when I was there, which isn't required, but you just feel really inspired while you're there. So you end up kind of doing a lot of stuff like that. But um, and what class at Penland was in vessels, is that correct? Yeah, um, I can't remember the technical name, but it was by Erica Bello. Um, mm -hmm. And she was teaching us like how to make different ways to, you know, like make vessels and whatnot. Like she, she I believe, showed hinge making and. And these are like the finished ones I did in that class, but there is like mm -hmm. other parts um, and components that I also like, when you're taking these classes, you do a lot of samples. So you might not necessarily create a finished work, but you'll have like my first hinge sample or something like that um, to be able to understand all the different technical parts. So, um, and then gone to three craft schools so that was Aramont and Gatlinburg, Penland in North Carolina and now this is Peters Valley in um, New Jersey. I always okay. want to say Pennsylvania but I made this piece in a week. I did a workshop on Memento Mori. I did like represe here and etching and that was a that was more of a kind of 
um, conceptual class where we learned a lot about <laughs> Mentamori jewelry and then made pieces that were inspired by that. So that was really fun. That was my first one I ever did. So which is another school. I have never... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. We have a technical issue. Oh, no um, I had never heard of craft schools before. Um, I really started talking to you about them. So thanks for sharing cool. that with our audience. Are no those um, are those schools that only artists can go to or could anyone go to? Anybody could go to. That, that was something that I, I kind of didn't realize um, before I went my first time, um, I was so nervous um, about going and whether or not I'd be like good enough or something or like 